Let's do it. It's go time. Welcome to Go Time, your source for wide ranging discussions from all around the Go community. Check us out on the web at gotime.fm. There you'll find our recommended episodes, the most popular ones, and a request form so you can let us know what you want to hear about on the pod. Thanks to our partners for helping us bring you Go Time each and every week. Fasty.com, Fly.io, and Tiosense.org. Okay, here we go. So, we are here for episode number two on the topic of what is new in the crypto library. And we have a really long list of things that we did not cover in part one. And to help us do this better this time, we also brought on board Nicola, who is joining Filippo and Roland. And for everybody who did not listen to the first episode, why don't we do another round of introductions? Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I help Filippo and Roland in maintaining the crypto SSH since uh, July. And uh, I'm Filippo. I've uh, been doing maintenance on the Go Cryptography libraries since uh, 2018. Uh, I was doing it at Google with Roland and Katie Ockman and uh, Damien Neal and plenty of others until 2022. And I'm now doing it as an independent maintainer. And I'm Roland. I'm one of the people on the Go security team. I've been around for uh, yeah, <laughs> some amount of time, three, three or so years, I think. <laughs> But have been working on Go as an I worked on Go as an outside maintainer for a while, and before that as an engineer at uh, the Let's Encrypt project. Filippo Roland, did you meet Nicola at Latin class? <laughs> 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 we were just talking in the before the beginning of the episode how uh, you all learned Latin at school. In Italy, it's a it's a very common thing, and we we're talking about the fact that it's you know not that hard when the language is so similar. Roland might have had a harder time. <laughs> yeah, I think that. I think the only Latin I remember is rather rude, so I won't repeat any of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the secret, though. Everybody thinks of studying Latin as this rarefied, high discussions about the maximum systems of the... No, no, seriously, they were pretty crude. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I know a lot of ways to insult Romans, but... <laughs> <laughs> like what? Well, the, uh, there was a, a comic book that I read that had the... Um, the explanation for the acronym SPQR is Sono Porci Questi Romani. <laughs> <laughs> Which means? Uh, Which, you know, <laughs> uh, they're, they're pigs, these Latins, or these Romans. I am recording from Rome. <laughs> <laughs> what did you have for lunch? <laughs> yeah, I guess the, the, that word is familiar from pizza menus. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so a brief recap of what we did cover in the first episode of what is new in the uh, crypto library for Go is at TLS 1.0, we talked about MathBig, about crypto, ECDH, about SHA-1 and MD5 deprecation maybe, about GoBugs, about um, some things that are planned for the future, like a safer, higher level APIs. And we briefly touched the crypto, uh, the SSH library that is under X, to which we will go back later. But now we want to talk about moving from pre-quantum to post-quantum. And before we talk into that, I want to say that I looked up how to say the present, the middle, something, what is between pre and post, and this is NUNC. So let's talk about NUNC quantum and then post-quantum. <laughs> um, I, I think everybody is starting to not like post-quantum, by, by the way, in, in the in the community, and they're starting to look for you know, new uh, suggestions, new words. So I'm going to suggest that. <laughs> what is the meaning of quantum in Latin? How does that translate? I have chat GPT here, so that's not a fair question. It's okay if you don't say you don't know. I think it's a small unit, right? It's a single, yeah. singular unit. Often you will talk about a quantum of something, a quantum of data, but I don't think that has any relation to the actual technology. I think they just pulled this. <laughs> because I think it comes from quantum mechanics, right? The mechanics of fundamental particles and using those, you can make computers that do things a little weird and they're superpositions and I'm not qualified to explain any of this, in fact. <laughs> I think it is all beyond all of our pay grades. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's the fun thing about uh, post-quantum cryptography is that we don't do it on quantum computers. 
the point is that quantum computers might come and we don't understand much about them, but when they come, they might break all of the stuff we are currently doing with cryptography. And so we have to implement some other cryptography that people who do know how com- quantum computers work think uh, are not going to get broken by uh, quantum computers. And then there's, you know, bickering about what being broken means and how to measure <laughs> that. And we don't talk about that <laughs> <laughs> debate. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's all very theoretical, but it's kind of, if someone does come up with a good way to break the current cryptographic primitives, we're in real trouble. So just on the off chance, there has been all of this work of trying to figure out new algorithms, which will not be susceptible to this very specific things that uh, quantum computers are good at doing, which leads us to the new NIST drafts. I don't know if you want to talk a bit about that, Filippo. Sure. So NIST has run a competition where a bunch of independent scientific groups submitted uh, various proposals, and then they run a bunch of uh, selection rounds, and they finally selected a key exchange, uh, two signatures, two? The NIST is a National Institute of Standard and Technology. Yes, uh, which does things like um, specifying cryptography like AES uh, and uh, SHA. But also you can buy from NIST a sample of the reference peanut butter. It might be the most expensive peanut butter in the world, and it's exactly the reference peanut butter that you can use to configure your machinery that needs to process peanut butter or something. I don't know. NIST is a weird institution. Uh <laughs> Cool. But yes, so they just like they have the peanut butter person, they also have the cryptography people. And the cryptography people select algorithms uh, and they then make uh, standards, which are the FIPS, the Federal Information Processing Standards, uh, which define how uh, the government, the US government, processes things. That's a fairly US centric process, but the community kind of came together around this one. I think a bunch of the submissions are not even from US scientists. And European governments already signaled that they like the things that NIST selected and that they're going to implement the same things. So good news is no brain pool this time, no German-only curves, no, I'm sure, I don't know, uh, there will be the Chinese and the Russian versions. uh, But, uh, you know, hopefully we'll standardize mostly on these uh, few algorithms. And they do the things that our old algorithms did. They just do it with a lot more bytes, unfortunately, but also hopefully they're not broken by quantum computers. So pros and cons. They're all significantly slower as well, right? You know, I was about to say that, but they're not. Like Kyber, (laughs) no, Kyber is faster than X2519. I was under the impression that, that they were slower, but I don't actually think that's the case. Well, that's good. Yeah, I, my very unoptimized uh, Kyber implementation is as fast as our very optimized X25519 implementation. And the slowest thing in the in Kyber is the hash because they selected SHA-3, which is very slow for no good reason. They made it do a lot of rounds of things. And anyway, that's that that's a whole story. But yeah, turns out it's at least the key exchange is actually faster. I was kind of surprised by that. However, then... Uh, with X519, you had mm, so uh, these are key exchanges. So they're the things where you have a connection, like a TLS connection or a SSH connection, and you want to establish keys to encrypt it, and you want to make sure that somebody who's watching and trying to intercept it cannot figure out the key. People might have heard about Diffie Hellman. That's a key exchange. So we don't get to do Diffie Hellman in a post quantum world. Uh, we thought we were going to, and then somebody went and completely broke the algorithm that was closest to Diffie Hellman. Super singular uh, isogenies. We, we, we love them while they, while they lasted. And we have these things called CAMs, uh, which are key exchange mechanisms, uh, which do a thing that's close enough. So just like we used to use Curve to 5519 to exchange keys and Diffie Hellman, uh, we can now use uh, things like Kyber, which is now called ML Chem because we can't have nice things. The two things selected were called Kyber and Dilithium. Such good names! And then they went and called them ML Chem and MLDSA. Which one do you want to be saying? <laughs> <sighs> yeah, the, the Star Wars Star Trek names are much better. Right? I'm not even a Star Wars and Star Trek fan, and I wanted those names. 
Nicola, do you do you agree with the sentiment? Did you also prefer these names? Yes. <laughs> and uh, Filippo, <laughs> what uh, what do you think would be the performance impact of, of using Shatri on a common uh, operation, for example, a, a SSH connection? Do you think it's not easy because we did some benchmark in the past and we, we chose it to, to not uh, include uh, SHA-512 um, uh, bas based algorithm because they are too slow? So with the Shatri, what, what is the situation? So I think the SHA-512 uh, algorithms were also using a larger uh, Diffie-Hellman group. And that was the very slow one. So the hashes, I think, are not, generally speaking, the slow part uh, here, except SHA-3 is slow, so it happens to dominate the key exchange uh, step. But to give some order of magnitude, I think that uh, both X2519 and Kyber using SHA-3 take, I don't know, I want to say, Okay, I don't actually remember that actual number, but let's say they take 10. F finite field Diffie-Hellman with a very large group is going to take like a thousand. That's the the, the, the gap uh, there. Like there's a hundredfold difference there. I think SSH is going to be fine. Actually, I think that OpenSSH uh, already has a um, post-quantum key exchange, except that they selected theirs before NIST selected one. So, yeah, it's not the one we're implementing in the Go standard library. So we hopefully they, they you know, they introduce a Kyber based one soonish. It seems highly likely that they will just because that's what everyone else is implementing at this point. Yeah. And also because, you know, FIPS 140, you want to be FIPS 140 compliant. Yeah, exactly. FIPS 140 is one of the standards and it's the one that say it was written for hardware, you know, the, the, the things you put in a rack, uh, and it said they have to be sealed, and it has to have a LED that does a, a certain thing. And when you turn it on with a key, it needs to check its circuits to make sure that it's not broken. And then they went and said, that, yeah, that's the standard you should follow for um, cryptographic libraries as well. Now, does anybody, can anybody think how you implement a LED in a library? You just flip a bit. You have a magic bit. Yeah, no, actually, seriously, there's a bit in memory. <laughs> Nothing can read it, but you set it to one when the LED should be on, and you set it to zero when the LED should be off. And then when the uh, uh, auditor comes and asks, where is the LED? You go, at that address in memory, and the auditor uh, says, good, good, you are compliant. And, and greet the global variable. Is, yes, yes, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's the worst. It's absolutely the worst. Anyway. <laughs> And that's, and that's how much I'll say about long life to global library, to global variable. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> FIS140 is, is a standard you have to comply with if you want to sell your things to companies that want to sell their things to companies that want to sell their things to the US government. That's a lot of people, unfortunately. Yeah, it turns out that's most people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the link is in the show notes in case anybody needs to meet that standard, is not familiar with it just yet. I, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, going back to, uh, to Kyber, um, the very annoying thing about these new algorithms is that they are the keys and the signatures and the exchanged things are so much bigger. And that's a problem. Like with Kyber, you're uh, looking at sending on the wire something like 1,300 bytes, you're sending a kilobyte of data, where with X25519, you are sending 32 bytes. Like we used to be like, ah, what's another uh, Diffie-Hellman uh, element? Just stick a few in there. Actually, let's make a ratchet where we go from element to element to element to element, and let's change keys all the time, and let's stick keys inside of keys, out of keys. And now we can't do that. We, we, we get one if we're lucky. Like a packet might fit one key. Now, that's not great. Yeah. This is going to be an even bigger problem for signature algorithms, right? Like we've been trying to figure out what the PQ, the post-quantum approach to certificate signing is. And there's still, you know, we've, there's been the last decade or so has been spent trying to figure out how to make certificates smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of the number of bytes that need to be sent over the wire. And now we're going, you know, all of the post-quantum signature algorithms result in keys that are or keys and signatures, which are orders of magnitude larger. So all of those gains that were, you know, hard fought for over the last decade have just been completely lost. And we now have certificates that are, you know, 
I think there were some suggestions where they would be megabytes in size. Yeah, I, is... I, I don't think we're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I hope not. <laughs> uh, but still, like with things like certificate transparency, we currently have, what, um, three signatures in a certificate, right? There's the signature over the whole certificate, and then there's the signature from two certificate transparency logs, which are these uh, public registries that... Uh, sign a statement that says, I will, pr I promise, I promise, I promise, I will publish this certificate so that anybody who wants to know what certificates exist can come look at the registry, which is very useful because, for example, you can sign up for a service like uh, CertSpotter, which, you know, CertSpotter is not sponsoring this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we very much love the, the operator because he does great work for the community. And you can sign up for that and say, oh, I would like to get an email every time a new certificate uh, is issued anywhere in the world uh, a certificate that would be trusted by browsers for uh, filippo.io so that if you know my uh, server gets hacked or uh, a CA makes a mistake uh, um, and they issue a not that CAs make mistakes to be clear yeah uh, unheard of I, I don't know what you're talking about yeah no men I, 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 I take it back but uh, <laughs> you can get an email and that's nice but that means there are you know, these statements went in the certificate. And since signatures were 32, 64 bytes, we were like, eh, just stick the 64 bytes in there. What's the problem? Now uh, signatures are going to be a thousand, uh, thousand bytes, a kilobyte like a, uh, or two. And we must hope in improving speed of internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Berlin does letters with <laughs> for security reasons you will never get like any password reset from your bank other than a or credit card other than a paper letter because no not enough internet for those things. N not a joke, this is real. How you have to reset your credit card number. Oh boy. Cypher suite ordering. Oh tell us yes. about that. Okay, so this is a thing I'm like a big fan of, and a lot of people hated me for it, I think. Uh, but this is ab about making things less configurable because that's, that's been a theme, right? We talked about it in the last uh, episode. We like to put uh, fewer options in and take care of things for, for the user. For those who didn't listen, one line recap. What are we, con what are we not configuring? Oh, because we should do our job and, you know, know things about cryptography so that uh, good developers don't have to do our job and know things about cryptography. So, for example, things that are right now configurable, but you're, you're well, you know, this is making them less. Before you could decide whether um, you wanted, uh, you liked better TLS RSA with AS256 GCM SHA384 uh, or TLS ECDH E ECDSA with 3 dash EDH CBC uh, SHA. Now, that sounds like our next Twitter poll. <laughs> better exactly. than unpopular opinion <laughs> poll. Can you, I will ask you to write that down <laughs> in the show notes in <laughs> the end and we will make that a poll just for the just Done. for the trolling yes. of it. <laughs> but, and, and these these cipher suites are so obscure and, and you know, which one is better than which is so obscure that basically, you know, one of, in every guide of how to set up Apache or any server, one of the steps would be you go to the Mozilla website and you there, there's a tool that they had which would generate the correct list of cipher suites in the correct order to put into your web server. And everyone just went and used the list that they suggested because there's no reason for any normal person to either know about this or care. <laughs> but then sometimes something happens and then you have to change your mind because the list yep. order has changed because, I don't know, something turned out to be more broken or less broken. And so you have to update your configs because... Your opinion mm -hmm. has changed, right? Because you had an opinion on those. And by the way, uh, I picked those two uh, as a trick. People might have heard three deaths and thought, oh, but that's from the 80s. I know the answer. It's the one without the thing from the 80s. And you would be wrong. The one with, with the uh, algorithm from the 80s is actually stronger than the other one. Why? That's going to be the second poll. When you heard that, <laughs> did you think of the think of the 80s? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is three from the eighties? Is three uh, something like that? <laughs> first published nineteen eighty one, and yep, uh, still doing better than the other thing because the other thing doesn't yeah. have uh, forward security, which I, you know, could spend a bunch of time talking about, or I could talk about how we took away the ability to sh uh, choose the ordering uh, for all of this stuff, and now we decide which ones are better. 
So for TLS 1.3, I actually somehow succeeded at pulling off, um, not putting a config option in at all. You can't turn them on, off, change the order. There's just not a config option. And people are kind of upset at me about that one. That's, uh, that's not so bad, M- much better in my opinion. Because, for example, when I, I write an app, my the open source app I maintain, since uh, the algorithm are very obscure, even, even for me, I simply exposed them to end users. And all the <laughs> while in, with TLS 1.3, it's much more simple. They are not configurable and the default are chosen by conscious, by people who know what they, they do. So it's much better. I prefer, I prefer this approach a lot. And some people were upset, but you know, still, I, I think I pulled it off. Uh, for TLS 1.0 to 1.2, it would b- break too many programs to say, oh, actually, you know, we'll pick which ones to enable and that's it. However, one thing we could take away was the order in which they're selected, which might sound silly. Like, what, what does the order matter? Well, the order matters because if you're selecting like five good ciphers uh, and one bad one, I have to worry that there are applications out there that might have put the bad one at the top of the preference list. So any client that uh, has support for that, uh, for backwards compatibility reasons, will end up negotiating a very bad algorithm when it could use a good one. And so we, we would have to have these conversations where we'd be like, well, do we remove it because it's kind of broken? It's not so broken that you wouldn't want it ever, but you would definitely not want it if you had any other option. But we have no way to make sure if somebody is using it because they don't realize they put just they just sorted them alphabetically maybe or something. And and so we would have the, all these difficult conversations around backwards compatibility because if you listen to the last episode, you know that the hard part of our job is neither post, uh, quantum computers nor algorithms, but it is backwards compatibility. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, So we have all these very difficult conversations. And then instead now with this change, the order is picked entirely by us. You can select them, but we know that if you selected anything else that's even slightly better than this, it will be used before we fall back to that. And that's important because, for example, there are some old Android phones. Uh, that will never get upgraded because they were sold before uh, Android knew how to force um, carriers to update phones. Uh, And uh, you want your server to still serve connections from them, but you want to make sure that just because you serve connections to them, you're not going to be less secure when somebody else connects, right? So with the fact that we handle the ordering, we can make sure that we will only go to the terrible algorithm that uh, Android, the only Android phones, that is the only thing Android phones support, only if it's the last resort. So yes, I, I get excited about the small things about backwards compatibility. What can I say? It, it, also, it also lets us do some fancy tricks about how we decide what the ordering is, right? We have, we have special logic in to determine, you know, if your computer has hardware support for certain algorithms, we can increase the priority of those algorithms in order to make you get better throughput on your connections. Whereas if, if the user picked them, it would be a bit awkward saying, well, actually, we've decided that uh, <laughs> we are going to reorder your specific ordering decisions because we know better. But now we can just say, we always know better. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What Ron is hinting at is that there's this uh, cipher, which is called AES, uh, which was selected by NIST, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And back then, cryptography was more about a thing you did in hardware with special chips and, you know, with machines, with keys and LEDs and uh, FIPS 140 certifications and all that. And so they designed an algorithm that's uh, pretty easy to implement in silicon, where you have, you know, you can draw out a blueprint and make the paths go through here. And you go like, yeah, you know, electricity goes through here at the same time. And that's how you make things go fast and simultaneously. And then the world changed. And now we implement most stuff in software. And implementing AES in software turns out to be very difficult because you have to read something from a table. But if you, if the attacker can tell what a slot in a table you read it from, they can just divinate the key 
Because as Swift on security says, uh, cryptography is math that care what pen you use to write it. And <laughs> so th the result is that... Wait, what does that mean? Uh, well, you know, normally if you just write the math it's correct regardless of what you used, right? And, and I think uh, what Swift on Security was getting at is that in cryptography, instead, you have to worry sometimes about side channels and stuff like that, where you might have written your program correctly. But since you took more time or less time, or maybe you accessed the cache or mm, the memory in a certain right, we order. Right, less time. Exactly. Now, mm -hmm. somebody who's observing what you did, even if the result was right, like you didn't throw an error, you didn't uh, do a panic, your tests all passed. There's no way to test this. But since you did it in this way, you touched memory over here. And I know that if you touch memory over here, it means that the first bit of your key is one. And then if you touch the memory over here, it means that your the second bit of your key is zero. And then you keep going like that, and then you just extract the key, and that's bad. It's generally frowned upon. So the result is that AS is a major pain to implement in software. We kind of figured it out now with a technique called bit slicing, which is basically re-implementing a hardware CPU, but in software, it's... Menace. It's like, I don't know if you've ever seen those videos of uh, computers inside Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, uh -huh. people building computers mm -hmm. by using uh, redstone and, and switches uh, and, uh, and torches and so on. Right. So the um, bit slicing, it's sort of like that, which really makes me think we should get all these kids uh, who build this stuff uh, in <laughs> Minecraft and ask them if they have nice ideas for fighting uh, side channel attacks in cryptography algorithms. But That's anyway. actually not a bad idea, Mindhive, right? Right. <laughs> also, lots of uh, people who start by reverse engineering uh, games or by doing game mods, them turn out to be mm, security engineers. There, there's a pipeline. Right. It, it turns out break, breaking the controls that uh, <laughs> developers put on their video games is really good training to break controls people put on secure systems. <laughs> turns out. And turns out if you can maintain software that's based on an, an undocumented <laughs> API that you reverse engineer every time a new version of a game comes out and that is willing to break you without even looking back, you actually can be pretty good at writing regular software too. Checks yeah. out. Oh. And working on a version of Java that's about 18 years old. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and patching the JVM so that you can, you know, make your <laughs> shader go a little faster so that you can make sp <laughs> uh, your ore sparkle or something. JVM is my keyword to move to quick. Yes, mm. actually. <laughs> 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 what is quick? And what does it have to do with a Go library? I don't actually know what quick stands for. It's an acronym. But it is, so there was a, um, at some point people decided that the HTTP... Quick UDP internet connections. Not just any UDP. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that is a nice trolling. Yeah, it originates from, there was a protocol written internally at Google that was used as kind of a prototype for what became Quick mm -hmm. that was originally called Speedy, S-P-D-Y. Oh man, that takes me And back. a lot of people who worked on that protocol worked on Quick and I think the the idea was it you know, quick is open source speedy, <laughs> or you know, um, IETF speedy. Yeah, IETF speedy exactly. By the way, I I googled quick uh, to see what, uh, the uh, acronym, and the first result is an Italian page that says the quick protocol, what it is, and how to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> like mood. <laughs> a reasonable, a reasonable approach to quick. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's essentially the next version of... It's often referred to as the next version of HTTP. I think, it's really a more... Yeah, I think how they ended up splitting it off is that Quick is the underlying pro, the transport protocol of HTTP3. Yeah. And HTTP3 is both the new HTTP semantics and... And a protocol. And the, the, the Quick uh, underneath it, right? Something like that. Yeah. So it's a cake. Uh, the, there's HTTP on top, and that's HTTP3. And then you have Quick, where you would have TCP. A quick is basically a way to implement TCP, because TCP is implemented by your kernel. And people have opinions about that implementation, and then the kernel, you know, doesn't change it. And so they go like, fine, I'll re-implement uh, TCP with black... Ch no, no. Uh, right. uh, with, uh, uh, with all of my features and encryption, and they implement it over UDP, which instead is just 
packets, right? Right. Uh, because the the internet uh, ossified, and now there are two internet yeah. protocols, and those are UDP and TCP. And you cannot have another one. If you want another one, you build it on top of UDP, like we used uh, to do in in the back old days. No. Yeah, it's like uh, if you look at the old OSI layer diagrams of of the internet, and it, the whole point of Quick is that over time, like yeah. The layers became incredibly complicated and necessarily needed to be interconnected. So Quick just takes like three separate layers and squishes them all into a single layer. The main useful thing to know about it is that it's encrypted by default. I don't think you can have unencrypted Quick. I don't think you can, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, unlike HTTP2, which was supposed to also be encrypted by default, but some people came along and figured out a way to make it H2C. Make unencrypted HTTP2. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Quick is, you know, is so ingrained that it is the perfect protocol. I think this is called the end-to-end -end principle, the concept that uh, yeah. all the layers move to the end points because the endpoints have the most context about what you need to do. So the TCP stack has to work for every application, while the browser knows it wants to load a web page so it can make different choices. Uh, one of my favorite facts about Quick is that it encrypts the headers, not for privacy, but because they really don't want uh, the network engineers to mess with them. So they just went like, you know what? You know what? We're going to encrypt the hell out of the headers so that you don't get to have an opinion. If that's not the end-to-end -end principle, I... Does this in any way affect crawlers? Crawlers are probably not smart enough to use Quick. Okay, so like this hiding the headers is not, not relevant. Oh, no, these are the headers that say things like how big the packets should be and how fast you should uh, send okay, them. Okay, okay, different completely ones. Yeah, these are the yes. things that like um, flow control and uh, all this stuff about TCP that I honestly don't understand. What, what it really messes with is middle boxes. Yes. Right, these like hardware devices that awful companies sell. <laughs> Well, I, I, I would say awful. The, the company said... You said it. You're on the record. Googler oh, uh, Roland Shoemaker no, said. No. <laughs> but they, you know, interfere with network traffic to do things. Often, you know, things you would rather they not do. Uh, and that break everything. Uh, and, and Quick very nicely makes it basically impossible for them to do that. Anyway, bringing it back to Go, yes. what are we doing with Quick and Go? So what um, at the bottom of this cake of layers, there's uh, TLS, uh, because they very correctly did not reinvent cryptography, and they just said, so we need some keys. So what we're going to do is run a TLS handshake over Quick, and then we'll take keys out of uh, TLS, and then we'll reinvent cryptography and do our own cryptography for transport. But they had good enough reasons for that. And the hard part is the handshake. Once you've no negotiated keys, the rest, eh, you know, then you, need, you need to make little wrapper packets and put a bow on it, but it's easy enough. So they run a TLS handshake over quick, and then they extract some stuff. Now, the problem is that our crypto TLS package was made to run TLS handshakes over TLS and over TCP. And we didn't want to have a fork in the quick implementation because that's bad, but we also didn't want to add a million options to the um, uh, to crypto TLS. So Damien Neal uh, and Martin from um, Protocol Labs. Uh, who's, yeah, Martin Seaman. Who's the um, uh, maintainer of uh, Quick Go, which was the external implementation that did have a fork of crypto TLS, which we did break regularly, every release, <laughs> uh, which did cause a lot of breakage in uh, the ecosystem, which was why Homebrew couldn't update to their Go version uh, for a month every time a new Go version came out. So all of that was not great. Uh, so now there's a bunch of crypto TLS APIs uh, that are a very small uh, hook into the crypto TLS library and that don't make me terrified of the complexity that was added. And they allow quick implementations, both the one that is it coming in the standard library is it not it's in 122 i don't think you can really use it but <laughs> oh wait the quick implementation or the uh, tls apis oh the tls apis oh, the tls api has been there for since 21 i think yeah uh, yeah. yeah, cool. And also Quick Go now uses the uh, the new TLS API in Go 121. Yeah. So now you can upgrade Quick Go and it will not break. And, and it, well, you can upgrade Go and it will not bre break Quick Go. And we're all very happy about that. 
Now, with that and the fact that Brad's package that breaks no moving GC doesn't break anymore, I think we can go back to upgrading Go and nothing should explode. Fingers crossed. Because our job is about... Backwards compatibility. Correct. <laughs> and, and, and now forwards compatibility as well. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Just finding the right link, because apparently when you search for the show notes, if you want to add the, the link to the Go implementation or like the, the official implementation it's not in the first five results but i i bet i will find this i find some i found something on a package tls i think uh yeah a lot of the quick stuff is currently hidden away in an internal package so that you can't mess with it too much because <laughs> uh, it is still it's still almost definitely a work in progress so the, what's the what would be a good practice for this i'm not sure i, I think we have an issue somewhere that discusses the the roadmap for quick but it's a very good question i could find a link for you and, <laughs> and send it to you later so just just not use this yet just know about this or what would be yeah. your recommendation I, I think it's yeah uh, quick is unlikely to be something that most people directly interact with it is something that should mostly be completely transparent to users you will you know make an http request and our underlying implementation will use quick if the other endpoint also supports it. For the network engineers, I'll leave the link there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I suspect most people will just be happy that it's happening and won't have to do anything. Fingers crossed. This is a changelog news break. One year after ChatGPT brought a seismic shift in the entire landscape of AI, a group of researchers set out to test claims that its open source rivals had achieved parity or even better on certain tasks. In the linked paper, they provide an exhaustive overview of this success, surveying all tasks where an open source LLM has claimed to be on par or better than ChatGPT. Their conclusion, quote, in this survey, we deliver a systematical review on high performing open source LLMs that surpass or catch up with ChatGPT in various task domains. In addition, we provide insights, analysis, and potential issues of open source LLMs. We believe that this survey sheds light on promising directions of open source LLMs and will serve to inspire further research and development, helping to close the gap with their paying counterparts. End quote. It's becoming increasingly clear to me that the data models powering future AI rollouts will be commoditized and democratized, thanks to the competitive nature and hard work of both academia and industry. What a relief. You just heard one of our five top stories from Monday's Changelog News. Subscribe to the podcast to get all of the week's top stories and pop your email address in at changelog.com slash news to also receive our free companion email with even more developer news worth your attention. Once again, that's changelog.com slash news. All right, let's talk then about the new path builder and the parser. We can do this very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Roland, all yours. These are these are old old X509. Not old, but these are we were major X509 changes that we made for, for TLS. The authentication layer of TLS uses X509 certificates, and X509 uses a encoding language called DIR, the Distinguished Encoding Rules, which we we had a you know Adam Langley who wrote a lot of the original crypto libraries, wrote a parser for that uses reflection, which is, you know, something we offer in Go, but is, I can't say terrible, but <laughs> it's quite slow. <laughs> it's a very interesting language feature, but it's kind of painful. And he wrote it using this because he, he said to me, the reason he wrote it using reflection was he had never used a language that had reflection before. And he thought it would be an interesting thing to use reflection for. I did not know this. Unfortunately, this turned out to have been a bad decision. <laughs> and was very slow in part because it did a lot of, you know, it, it had to allocate a lot of small bits of memory all over the place. So I think, I think it was in 120 or 119, we changed, I wrote a new, we had this new library called CryptoByte, which is a, it's a way to write explicit parses where, you know, you know the structure of your data and you can very efficiently parse it. 
Um, so instead of using reflection and, and needing to support, you know, every single type in the Go uh, type system, we could write an explicit parser that says, like, I know exactly what the format of this certificate should be, and I can just pass it in one fell swoop. Yeah. For comparison, encoding ASN1, you would make a struct uh, with an int and a byte slice yeah. and with some tags, which is like JSON does. Instead, with CryptoByte, there's a function that says, hey, read an integer from the string. Great, now uh, read this other thing from the string. Great, now read another value from the string. And you just call those one after the other and you put code in the middle if you need to check something and it's much more explicit, a little more boilerplate, but this is Go, we like boilerplate. Yeah, and, and because it knows exactly what it's doing, it needs to allocate a lot less and it's a lot faster. So the, this, the top level takeaway here is that we managed to speed up certificate passing by something like 80%. It got incredibly quick, which took away a big amount of overhead from TLS connections, which was very nice. And solved problems I had left behind, like, oh no, we are parsing certificates in a hot path and we don't know what to do about that. We'll have to add caches or do very smart things. And then Roland came along, made it all faster, and now <laughs> it's not a problem anymore. Cheers. <laughs> well, we still did some of those things anyway, but <laughs> that's another story. Uh, but maybe we should move on to, to SSH. I think, you know, X509 is my pet project, but I think I am one of about 15 people in the world that finds it interesting. So, Okay, Nicola, what are you excited most about in the, in the upcoming changes for SSH? Yes, there are a lot of, uh, of change we added in, uh, in the last month. For example, we, SSH is, uh, is a, a suite of protocol allowing to connect uh, of, uh, security of the network to, to remote host. For example, to, uh, to log in, a typical example of use of SSH is to get a login shell to a remote server or to transfer a file. Um, so uh, recently we added a, 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 a new implementation to avoid uh, passive network of server from detecting uh, keystroke. Because the idea is, uh, is simple because the client uh, can just emulate keystroke at a fixed interval if there is no activity. For example, if you stop uh, typing, uh, the client can send some packet. So, since SSH is a client-server protocol, there are already a lot of, of messages uh, defined to exchange the data between client and server. And the client may use one of the existing messages to emulate his stroke. This will be the, the simplest thing. Uh, unfortunately, this do, does not work because the existing packet, <laughs> have, uh, existing message, have two limitations. The first one is, is their size. They are too big. So a network observer can uh, detect if a, a data is a keystroke or not a keystroke. Another limitation is that uh, there isn't a, a message allowing to send a sequence of bytes and returning the same sequence of bytes. For this reason, OpenSSH, the leading SSH implementation, added a protocol extension at uh, transport moment, a, a, classical, uh, a classical ping. You send uh, some byte and the, the server send back this, uh, this byte. So uh, we can, we, a client may use this ping message to emulate keystroke. Obviously, a client cannot send, cannot send this ping message unconditionally. There, was, there, there is the need to advertise this, uh, this feature. Because as usual, our job is about backwards compatibility <laughs> yes <laughs> we cannot uh, we cannot break things because uh, people are uh, very angry if uh, they if we block the work so so we cannot do things like this and uh, for this reason the, the 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 protocol the new this new extension is uh, uh, advertised using the standard uh, xtm4 message and the extension is called ping at openssh.com with version zero. Soon after, the, this feature shipped in uh, OpenSSH, after a few days, 
we uh, we are dedicated to, to our crypto SSH library. Generally, is we are not so fast, so fast. <laughs> but this time, yeah, that's something I'm I'm v- very p- proud of, and you know, for values of proud, where I'm proud of the work other people are doing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because. Uh, the Xcrypto SSH package didn't have an active maintainer, I think, for the past year, uh, year and a half, couple of years. And so... I think, I think perhaps longer than that. <laughs> perhaps longer than that, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so how it was maintained is, uh, was that I would just go and extinguish fires when they were like really, really big and otherwise nothing was happening. It was so far behind OpenSSH, which, as Nicola was saying, drives a lot of the progress uh, of the protocol. And instead, this one, I think we actually merged it we had the CL already before the uh, OpenSSH release yes. and merged it just a few days after it came out. We started to, to work on this feature uh, basically to get our OpenSSH team. So the CN was ready before OpenSSH released this feature and was merged just after they released the latest OpenSSH version. And the reason this is happening, by the way, is that Nicola is, uh, is now uh, working on maintaining that, thanks also to all the funding from, from my clients, which, sorry, um, I'm not going to say the, the, the whole names. I'm not, this is not a, a sales pitch, but yeah, I'm, I'm so happy we could get Nicola to do that maintenance work. Of course, uh, I don't work alone on this. Filippo helped me a lot, Roland helped me. Uh, Russ, other Go, Go team members uh, helped me in the, the approval process because there is a very formal approval process before shipping and fishing because we have to to, to keep the quality of compatibility. <laughs> 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 because our job is about backwards compatibility. <laughs> Sometimes we cannot be uh, too, too fast to ship a feature because we have to think about the impact on our user and if uh, this feature uh, introduce a uh, breaking change. Yeah. B- before Nicola was around, one of the things that developed into a big fire uh, was SHA-2 support. So basically, SSH was, the, the protocol was hard coding SHA-1 in some places, and SHA-1 is a hash that has a collision uh, issue now. Uh, you can make two things that hash to the same SHA-1 hash, which might sound like a party trick. It's actually very annoying because the security properties of some things rely on that not happening. So we've been moving off SHA-1 for the past 20 years I think, uh, 25 by now. And uh, OpenSSH finally moved off and started turning off the the, the SHA-1 things. And guess who had not implemented SHA-2 yet? Well, not SHA-2, SHA-2 in general. We had SHA-2 since the dawn of time, uh, but did not implement the SHA-2 extensions to replace the SHA-1 in SSH. Oh, we used to be of course. <laughs> and then at some point, uh, they um, I think it was uh, GitHub was about to uh, turn off their uh, SHA-1 support. And they had this nice blog post being like, here's our roadmap. If anybody's still not supporting SHA-2, they should probably do something about it. And... I, I, I want to find the engineer who wrote those and ask if there was a, you know, a between the lines, looking at you, go. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it wasn't just GitHub, was it? It was also OpenSSH that ended up removing... Oh, OpenSSH had, had turned it off like months earlier, but all of the distros had turned it back on in their uh, configs, uh, except Fedora. So we were actually already broken on Fedora. <laughs> But turns out that being broken on Fedora does not get people with the people with the pitchforks out, but not being able to connect to GitHub. Also Arc Linux. On Arc, I was the first one who noticed this, uh, this breakage. <laughs> Initially, I didn't understand what, what is happening. I, I thought, uh, but uh, the, test case, the test case, my test case on uh, continuous integration system works fine. On my PC, it does, does not work anymore. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> What's really funny? And yeah, also importantly, the, the version of OpenSSH bundled with Mac OS was updated to the... Yes. In, in fa- in, indeed, Philippe added this support as soon as uh, Mac OS <laughs> updated because yes. he, he, was a bring, uh, he was broken. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, turns out, b- break the maintainer. That, 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 that helps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so... 
you know, I shipped initial support for that, uh, but then, uh, you know, foreshadowing, Nicola, you were the first one to notice the breakage, but little did you know that it would become your job to then clean up after all that, <laughs> because it was such a painful upgrade, actually. Uh, Nicola, want to tell us about it? Yes, it was uh, basically uh, the first uh, the first support was something workish because uh, we, <laughs> we we taken some time before people realized that there there were uh, <laughs> another breakage. So it was uh, it was something uh, to to do. In my defense, um, OpenSSH itself implemented this wrong for the first five versions. This is this is the, exactly the package I'm I'm thinking about because after the initial support, we started to get reports because all the OpenSSH version doesn't work properly because their bug also uh, GPG GPG agent some old version of GPG agent. Uh, stopped working, and so we had a lot of, uh, of new issues. Basically, our problem was that uh, we have a, a senior interface that uh, is un- were unable to uh, advertise the supported algorithm. So uh, we, you can just assume that uh, all algorithms are, su- are supported, but this is not, this is not applicable anymore. So we need to introduce a new, a new interface, a multi-algorithm senior, a multi-algorithm senior, so uh, advertise the supported algorithm, so you can uh, you know the, the supported algorithm, and you can choose the one to use for, for seeing. This, uh, this is our way to fix the issue, because we can, with, the multi, with supporting the multi-algorithm senior, allow it does to provide the API, to restrict and choose client side, server side, and also certificate seeming algorithm. Because one of the biggest issues with OpenSSH are the certificate that is a different standard from X509 certificate. It's something different. And uh, this, uh, this introduced a lot of issues with the with old OpenSSH version. Since a few days, we merged the, last, the latest fix, so I think, I hope we have no more regression on this area, at least for a no, while. don't say that, don't say that, don't say that. <laughs> I just check my mail to see if I get the help. Do not say that. I mean, we joke that our job... Christmas freeze is coming. Uh, we joke that our job is backwards compatibility, but the open S- the SSH protocol has been at two, point, uh, at two point something since 2006, I just checked. So, you know, there's a reason they have so much complexity layering uh, and layering, and they did a better job than TLS did at the time. But some of the results are maddening because, for example, the the change Nicola was talking about had to deal with the fact that there used to be just key types. You know, if you use an RSA key type, you make an RSA signature and that's it, right? If you use an ECDSA key, you make an ECDSA signature. But then they went like, well, you might want to use an RSA key to make a signature that uses SHA-2, not SHA-1. And so we got key type algorithms and signature algorithms, and those start, started being separate with a one-to-many mapping. But then, you know, sometimes your that key is actually part of a certificate. So are you negotiating the algorithm to say, I support certificates, or are you uh, negotiating uh, just the underlying key? But when you make a signature, it's not a special certificate signature, it's just a signature. So sometimes you refer to the key type, sometimes you refer to the key type, but also certificates. Sometimes you refer to the algor- uh, signature algorithm, and sometimes you s- uh, refer to the signature algorithm, but also the certificate algorithms. This is an evil. I got mad the first time I tried <laughs> to run this page. I wrote it at least two or three times before I started to understand something. I don't. Uh, I don't know if you remember my desperate help uh, help request. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I also remember that every time we go back and we change something similar, we get on a call and we're like, "Wait, is this an underlying algorithm or is the key type?" Wait, no, no, no. This, this one can be a certificate, right? We absolutely need to do something to to fix this because it's really. Oh, we have two choices. The first one is uh, don't mo- don't change any more that code. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of no more bug reports. No more. No more. 
<laughs> that sounds good to me. <laughs> Done. All right. I, th- I think this, this was quorum and uh, majority <laughs> for... <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> we'll file a proposal that the whole libraries are now freeze, uh, frozen. <laughs> perfect. So no, backward, no more backward compatibility. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, perfect backwards compatibility. We yeah. never change anything. If you never implement anything. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Throwback to Kelsey Hightower is no code. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that's the dream. <laughs> but by the way, um, speaking of, of changes, this is a bit of a uh, hopping topic, but I, I just saw an email uh, arrive during the recording. Uh, and Are you doing something else, Filippo? Ah, no. Yes, I, I cannot manage my attention. <laughs> um, but CL just got merged. And now MathRand in Go122 is going to be cryptographically safe uh, by default. The, the default uh, random number generator is switching to ChaCha8 so that if you, by mistake, use MathRand instead of CryptoRand, at least it will not explode in very pyrotechnic ways. It will not. And for more very... details, episode one. We got yes. a lot of information about that there. I, exactly. Cool. We talked about it, but... The, and the, now the, the magic merge, happened. The merge happened exactly during the, the, the episode. Sorry for the interruption, but like I'm just so happy about this. <laughs> well, that's that's great news. Shall we celebrate the end of the episode on this festive spirit, saying uh, in one <laughs> I don't know in one feature, no explanation. What is your favorite uh, change in SSH uh, that is upcoming that we did not mention yet? If we cover them all, then we go to the unpopular opinion. I, I think N- Nicola probably has a list, so we'll think about <laughs> it well. <laughs> yes, a feature I like I like a lot is the ability to to make we can now make every algorithm configurable. So, for example, there are many people that complain about FIPS. We speak it before. We have to improve this. We have to uh, provide a FIPS mode also for uh, for SSH for uh, SSH. But uh, FIPS uh, can now be achieved because you can configure every algorithm. You can also disable, for example, completely SHA one, even if for backward compatibility we still use SHA one by default for some for some algorithm. But the, the important thing is that you can you can configure all the algorithms as you want. This is was important also for uh, for my work as open source maintainer for my project. I now can disable anything uh, showing show one repeated uh, by default. This is very important. Uh, the project Nicole is talking about is SFTP Go. Um, yes, I, I picked him out of SFTP Go maintainership, because, and that's how I knew he c- could maintain Xcurrent SSH. I got in touch with Filippo uh, with my project because I need yep. some some features in Open S- in SSH <laughs> library, and I started to send some CN. And I got opinioned uh, by Filippo. <laughs> <laughs> he called me uh, and he signed, do you want to become the new maintainer? <laughs> so it turns out, if you get a, a bunch of bug reports, you can make it that person's problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The next GPT is just saying, thanks for your bug report, please fix it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but by the way, we are talking about how, I think we started saying how not having configurability is good, and we are closing with how we are happy that there's more configurability. <laughs> I want to call it out, but there is an important difference. In the first one, yes. the, we like the defaults. In the latter one, the defaults were so bad that being able to configure them off is a step forward. You know, a V2 of the API can remove all of the configurability and leave only the good things behind. But when you have so much bad stuff, the fact that at least you can turn it off, much big uh, uh, thumbs ups. Mm-hmm. But another important difference and it is in the SSH world, there are um, more older devices that never got updated. A browser is uh, all modern browsers are updated, so you can remove all the algorithm more easily. I frequently get uh, reports of clients unable to connect because they maybe use also something terrific algorithm. For example, ask for. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there, yeah. There are, there are no more than one year ago. I got uh, a, a people asked me to how he can enable Ask Four. That is an algorithm <laughs> from uh, from uh, at least uh, another era. Eighties for sure. 
80s for sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. I'll pick a very quick one. One thing that I think might be waiting for my review, so sorry about that, uh, but that's coming is much better tests that test Xcrypto SSH against OpenSSH so that we don't have to wait until it breaks on my laptop or on uh, on GitHub to, to figure out that it's not working with the latest OpenSSH. Nicole is building a whole harness that will run the SSH uh, binary and like make recordings of the, the connection and make sure that it's always doing the, the thing that's expected and that's just great yeah i was going to say the exact same thing <laughs> i think this is you know one of the greatest changes that this library is going to get because it will make our lives easier for the next you know next five years you, you can see how jaded roland and i have become <laughs> where, where where we go oh yeah i mean i'm so excited about tests there's going to be so many tests. Ooh, tests. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I gave a whole uh, GopherCon uh, talk and it was not about cryptography or post-quantum or anything like that. It was like, want to see some really neat tests. <laughs> well, uh, um, I also blocked a test on Windows. There was a report on <laughs> of a Windows test uh, that is not only on Windows 11, it seems. I cannot reproduce it locally. Oh, no. I have um, Ashy, the Go Maintainers, uh, no, I'm not I said this, uh, this breakage, so I have to investigate it. There are some uh, tests against SSH CLI, open SSH, that does not, does not work on Windows 11. Don't break the build, Hashi will find you. But uh, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think this is, uh, this is not a bug in my code. Because it's uh, really related to position. <laughs> it's still your problem. <laughs> <laughs> if you broke it's the bill. It's another problem. I, I'm quite sure. It's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> if, that, if your comet is the one that broke the bill, your comet yeah. is the one that gets uh, reverted. No, the bill, the bill broke it after my comet. When, after they updated the, the, the test environment. <laughs> oh, th then it's definitely Hashi's problem, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Consensus. So now let's move to an <laughs> Popular opinion. I actually think you should probably leave. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm the older years. I'm very old, more, more older than, uh, than all of you. <laughs> and so my unpopular opinion is uh, using... Uh, all the style keyboard instead instead the only ones the all the old style keyboard when you can hear the very very loud when you when you do a keystroke for example <laughs> is it good or bad for hacking hearing the keystroke <laughs> very, very good it's it's not uh, good for your neighbors they exactly <laughs> know when, uh, when you had it work <laughs> that's what's unpopular about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you have any roommates so <laughs> uh, i like that we went to, immediately to roommates and we forgot the existence of offices uh, like i think all three of us have not worked in an office for years <laughs> now four <laughs> Four. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My my cats get very annoyed at me when I type very loudly on my keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you interrupt their sleep, I get that. I'm on their side. <laughs> 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 you should be considerate. Do you have an unpopular opinion? Oh, I think I have a I have a contemporary unpopular opinion, which is that as much as I I think AI is a real pain in terms of code generation. I think it generates terrible code, but I love it because I think it is creating job security for security engineers. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it will be for the considerable future. <laughs> cool, cool. We just held in Berlin like two weeks ago uh, B-Sides, which is a security conference, and we had two out of the nine talks about AI. Mm -hmm. So cool. Filippo, do you have an unpopular opinion? I mean, I'm tempted to counter your unpopular opinion with the unpopular <laughs> opinion that I do use copilot in cryptography code, but only to write error messages because I hate writing <laughs> uh, error messages, but no, no, no. So I think my unpopular opinion, and I will probably get yelled at for this one, but it's that... That's your goal. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, there's a reason open source maintainers don't get donations, and I think the companies are not wrong. Like asking for donations 
Companies cannot uh, do donations. That's not a thing they know how to do. That's not a thing they're even supposed to do. How do you justify to your board if you start making donations by the tune of like hundreds of thousands of dollars to support all your uh, downstream uh, dependencies? And I think as I- a tax entity, you cannot do give donations to a, something that is not a nonprofit. There you go. <laughs> like exactly. There's a legal like- definition to what can a company donate to. Exactly. And then I have maintainers who I truly understand the plight of because, like, hi. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, and then they come to me and they're like, but, but I have all of these users and they uh, make so much money out of it and they don't donate any of it uh, to me. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, they don't donate money. That's not what they do. Give them a, send them a PDF send them an invoice, offer them something. It doesn't have to be much. Logo on the page, support hours. I mean, I actually have a whole idea of what you can offer them. And there's a changelog uh, podcast episode if you want to hear about that. But the unpopular opinion is not about everybody should be doing what I'm doing. What I'm doing is kind of weird and uh, you know, we'll find out if it uh, works. But donations are not it. And getting angry at companies for not donating uh, money I don't know on the moral level if it's right or wrong. You know, capitalism might be all wrong, and I will prob- I would probably agree with that argument. But since we do live in capitalism, donations will just not work. Technically, it doesn't work for companies. You, it's true that you have to offer something. There you go. Offer a sticker for a thousand bucks, but offer a sticker. <laughs> offer <laughs> some, sell something. Yes, uh, and and then send them a invoice, a PDF. Uh, sign up for bill.com. It's Fine, it's a web UI. I promise you'll be okay. Developers don't like paperwork. I have a solution. <laughs> Make my wife do all the paperwork and send the PDF. <laughs> this is what's the solution. Yeah, handling a, uh, marrying a responsible adult is a great strategy in life. Kudos, you, you hacked right. it. You won. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I... Um, the thing though is that I never heard a dentist say the same thing. <laughs> no. Like I never, I never heard a dentist say, you know, I, I really like teeth, but I really don't like paperwork, so I don't bill anybody. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> uh, we have to make enough money to hire somebody to to do the administrative work, which I think is it's a chicken and the egg problem. Fair enough. You're saying dentists also hire somebody to uh, get uh, get them to do the oh, paperwork. Exactly. I, I, I guess that's fair. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> well, they, they hire people whose specifically job is to do like insurance billing. <laughs> oh, right. The US. I had forgotten about yeah, all yeah. that. Sorry. I, I had forgotten that for every doctor you have like five administrative people. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, it's a little different over here. <laughs> yeah. Well, my unpopular opinion is uh, in the also a non-software world, um, cooking. I think kitchens are overrated, and I think most households, all they need is a multi-cooker. Specifically, I can recommend for my personal use uh, the Ninja Foodie. I forget, 16-in-1 or something, 15-in-1. I, I can, like, remove my kitchen. If it would be less of an effort, I would just throw away the entire kitchen, take one square meter, put the pot there, and that's it. That and the disher. I, I think it's very brave of you to to say this in the presence of two Italians. I know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I was here thinking that if it can make pasta, I might be down. <laughs> it can do anything. It can make the sauce. Like So today what I did is is the sauce for tomatoes, like a, um, vegan meatballs. So I, I took the vegan thing, fried it there, then put the tomato sauce there, like everything in one pot, and then it goes into the disher. Not like, you know, if you have a special fancy pan, you will not, you'll have to hand wash it. You're going to have to have two pots, right? Maybe, no. I'm Italian, but I'm completely unable to cook. So I, <laughs> I'm actually also a terrible cook. Uh, I can cook pasta, uh, which, okay, by Italian standards, I'm a terrible cook. Uh, by US standards, actually, I would always like cook pasta and risotto and be like, oh yeah, yeah, like I'll cook dinner for everybody, don't worry. And like, and then people would be like, oh yeah, this is so great, this Italian pasta. And, and I, I'd be like, It's yeah. like Parmigiano. It, yeah. It, it's like, not Parmesan. That's, uh, that's what makes it the fast good. <laughs> it, I mean, pretty much. Uh, the fewer ingredients, the, the better. So the easier, the better. Turns exactly. Out. If this is your approach, a multi cooker is all you need in life. Throw away the rest of the kitchen. I am listening. <laughs> My landlord might not appreciate that, but we'll tell him <laughs> after. <I'm done. laughs> the thing in Germany is when you move into an apartment, it's empty. It does not have a kitchen. And Wait, then really? 
Yes, unless you, you move into a fully rented apartment, the standard, like a normal apartment, is uh, A, long term, so there's never a deadline in the in the contract, but there's also no kitchen. There's also no lamp. There's like a cable hanging from the ceiling. You're lucky if there's a bulb. But usually the first thing you do when you sign a rental contract, which is like three months in the future, you also order a kitchen because that also takes three months. That does make sense. So for especially for people with such setups, it's amazing. Yeah. A sink is something that has to be in the apartment. <laughs> okay, so you do get a sink. Nice. Uh, no, in Italy, if you get something unfurnished, it might not have the lamp, uh, but it will have the kitchen, which I guess says something about Italians. And Germans. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see which unpopular opinion wins. May the odds be in our favor. Thanks, everybody, who joining. And let's pretend this is the outro tune. Da -da -da -da. That is go time for this week. Thanks for hanging with us. Subscribe now. If you haven't already, head to gotime.fm for all the ways. Also, check out Changelog News while you're at it. It's the software industry's best weekly podcast slash newsletter to keep you plugged in to developer news worth your attention. Subscribe now at changelog.com slash news. Thanks once again to our partners, fastly.com, fly.io, and typesense.org. And thank you to Breakmaster Cylinder for producing so many fresh beats for us that we're now releasing full-length albums on Spotify, Apple Music, and the rest. Listen along by searching for Changelog Beats in your music app of choice. You'll find us. That's all for now, but we'll talk to you again next time on Go Time. Mm-hmm.